Amen. Well, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And uh, we are in our Waymaker series. I believe this is miracle number 4 out of 12. And so we got a little heart uh, today. And uh, so that is the icon. And the title of the message today is Funeral Crashers. Funeral Crashers. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. And so today... Jesus is going to crash a funeral. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? <laughs> well, no one was planning on Jesus showing up, but everyone was glad that he came. And we are going to highlight two things today. Number one, that Jesus cares about our grief. He cares. And number two, Jesus cares about our future. So as we look at Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, it is it's not a long passage. And it is a kind of a peculiar passage um, with a city that is not that known, you could say, relatively unimportant. Um, this miracle is only found in the book of Luke. This city of Nain is only mentioned once in the whole Bible, as far as I know. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. So when it says the day after, this was the next day after the centurion servant was healed. And remember, the centurion servant was healed in Capernaum. And Capernaum was up north, uh, the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. And the next day, uh, they were in a location called Nain. And there is a modern city called Nain. Um, it is 25 miles away from Capernaum. First thing I thought, that's some strong cardio. One day, 25 miles, man, they went from the Sea of Galilee all the way down. And so this city called Nain is located right outside of Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. But the day after, they were 25 miles away from where they originally were. So they got their cardio on. Jesus, his disciples, this large crowd following him, probably from seeing the centurion servant healed. Hey, we got to stay around this guy. We got to see what's going to happen next. And so when they approached the city of Nain, the gates were open. And as I was reading this, it kind of felt like it was like a funeral or something like that. It kind of, in the early verses, like it was a, a funeral procession. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it was because it had mentioned a coffin. And so this young man who died was being carried out of the city to his tomb because it would be unclean for a dead person to stay in the city. So that's why they had to carry him out. And the word Nain in the Greek, its meaning is beauty. 
And so Jesus and the crowd and the disciples, they came but to this city that is named Beauty. But this was not a beautiful scene at all. This was a tragic scene of grief. You know, the Jews, they did not use coffins because they did not bury people underground. They buried people in tombs. So instead of a coffin, they used what they would call um, a bier, B-I-E-R. And it was like a, a plank or a stretcher. And they would put the dead person on there and they'd be wrapped in lin linens and have some uh, spices and uh, wrapped all in there. And then they would go out of the city to their tomb. And Luke is very careful to add these details. Um, I'm a detailed guy. It's a blessing and a curse. It's like I see every little thing, and, uh, which is good and bad. But I love it how Luke adds these details. He was a doctor, physician, very careful. So verse 12, you see key details. A dead man was being carried out, but here it is. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So this is very important to the story. So this was not just any funeral. This was a tragic funeral. So this widow, at some point before that, had to bury her husband. And some people in there have went through that process. They have had to bury a spouse. Even my father went through that process. My mom died when... She was 29 years old. I never talked to him about that, but I can just imagine the emotions and how difficult that was. Um, so this widow had to bury her husband, and, and now she has to bury her only son. She only had one son. So now she has to bury her son as well. So this is a very difficult situation what we would call a tragedy. And on top of this, in first century culture, widows had no means of support or protection, which made them vulnerable to hunger and assault. Many uh, women who were widows, they were too old for labor, so they couldn't really contribute uh, to society. And, and they had no uh, man to uh, protect them and you know, people are evil and people take advantage of vulnerable people. And so the first thing that I want to uh, emphasize in this story is that Jesus cares about our grief. And I just want to let you know that he cares about your grief today. You know, death is a reality that we all have to face. Uh, many of us has, have lost someone that we love. Some of us are in the process of losing someone. But Jesus cares about our grief. And the way that he shows us that he cares about our grief is that he died on the cross. And then he rose again. And he did that to give us hope. The Bible says that we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who don't have hope. So Jesus showed that he cared about our grief when he died on the cross. And then when he rose again, he defeated the enemy of death. Because see, everyone was mocking him and ridiculing him and saying, if you're the son of God, just come down from the cross. If you're all that, you say you're the Messiah, just come down from the cross. Right? And in his humility and in his sacrifice, he stayed on that cross for six hours, humiliated naked for us. And death had thought, hey, I won. I, I have the victory. But then Jesus went in the tomb Friday and Saturday, but then on Sunday, he rose again. So death did not win. Jesus won. And by him winning, yes, we grieve, but we have hope. When we grieve, Jesus gave us that hope. He shows that he cares about us by giving us hope. 
So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see here the victory that Christ has given us. Grieving is a real thing, but we grieve differently. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 through 57. It talks about the, the, the resurrection that the dead in Christ will have as a result of the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus cares about our grief. We grieve with hope. We have victory through Jesus Christ. We have the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. When we look at the Gospel of John in John 11, verses 25 through 26, again, Jesus is talking about the resurrection. And in John 11, verse 25, he is speaking to Martha. John eleven twenty-five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I mean, these are huge promises that if we believe in Jesus Christ, that we will never die. We will become immortal because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We will get, be given a new body, and the Bible says in the book of Philippians that we will be like him. We will see him as he is. And so Jesus cared not only about uh, the eternity of the widow, but her livelihood. And notice in this story, as, as we're back into Luke, he shares the details in verse 12. And then in verse 13, it says, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. So the Lord didn't see this uh, procession, and he didn't say, you know what? I need to preach the gospel to this widow right now. He didn't say that. There, I, I don't see any preaching. All I see is compassion. No religious talk, just compassion. And so when he saw her, he met the need. And it makes me think about in my life, yes, I want to preach the gospel to everyone, but some people just need our compassion. When we see them, when we see him or her, when we see that person in our life, just compassion. Sharing the gospel is fabulous. Proclaim salvation and make disciples, but some people need our compassion. And I started thinking about who in my life needs compassion? Who can I show the compassion of Christ to? Because Jesus didn't mention uh, this lady's sin to her. He, he, it just said when he saw her, he had compassion on her. He didn't hesitate. He didn't think, oh, let me think what I'm going to say. He just went and met this need. Jesus took a specific action to help her. And we may not even realize all that Jesus does to help us in our grief. He helps us in prayer. He helps us through the Word of God. You know, this Word of God is so powerful. Uh, I just want to encourage you, like, it's great to come to church on Sunday. It's great to hear a word. Like God has something to say on Sunday. That's why you come. God is going to speak on Sunday. 
right? He's going to speak through his word. He's going to speak as I have prepared and prayed. He's going to speak to you. That's why you come. And, and I want to encourage strong church attendance. That's really important. You know, because this day and age, people put other things above church attendance. There's so many other things you could be doing on Sunday. I drove past the golf course today, and man, it looked like a nice day for golf. <laughs> I was like, there's going to be cars out there today, right? As a basketball coach, like the youth sports and the tournaments, like a lot of them are on Sunday. These games are on Sunday. And I understand some people have a job to do, and so they have no choice but uh, being a church on Sunday, it, where, where are our priorities at? You know, the, the studies say that people only come to church regular active attenders one to two times a month. So where are our priorities at? But outside of Sunday, it's so important for us to be in the Word on a daily basis. Like we can't be like a closed Bible uh, fellowship outside of Sunday. You can't say, well, I'm going to open my Bible when I go to life group. <laughs> when that is, once a month, twice a month, right? I'm going to open my Bible when I come to church, if I even remember my Bible. I might just, you know, maybe I left my Bible at home. I don't know, should I bring my Bible? I, for, for me, like I spend a significant time in this word every week, but it's more for you guys. So it's serving out, but I also have to be poured into like you have to be poured into. So I'm just like you. I'm like, hey, I need to find a plan. Uh, January 1st already passed. I'm a little late for these Bible reading plans, but uh, let's see what they got. So I just dialed up a new reading plan for myself. It's, uh, I was like, it might be a little unrealistic for me to read through the Bible in one year, uh, given the a commitment that I have to preaching the word, um, but I need to be reading. And for me, I'm just more of a systematic, like plan type of guy. It helps me. So I, I just started a, a new Bible reading plan on uh, version, the Holy Bible app. So maybe uh, I just want to encourage you today. Maybe that's something that you can do. And I'm just, uh, hey, I'm not trying to read the whole Bible in 30 days. You know, I'm just trying to be in the word to be encouraged, right? That's what we need. So I got this plan that Psalms, Proverbs, and New Testament in a year. It's like about a chapter a day or 10, 20 verses a day or something like that. So I just want to encourage you uh, to be in the Word of God because this Word of God helps us in our grief. It helps us in our discouragement. And we need it. We need God to be our shield. And as we read the word and as we encounter circumstances in our life, we go back to the word that we just read. We go back to the word that we just journaled about, and it helps us. Jesus cares for us in our grief, and he's given us this word to help us. He's also given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us in our grief. He's also given us the church or God's people to come to our aid. You know, if you have um, an issue that you're going through with grief and you let us know, uh, we will come to your aid. People at our church are waiting to come to your aid and waiting to help you. And my wife and I have experienced the love at Antioch Bible Church. When we're undergoing grief, how the church just showed up Antioch love showed up, and they'll do it for you too. So Jesus is here to help us in our grief. Jesus cares about our grief. He not only cares about our etern eternity, he cares about us as we grieve. And the other thing that Jesus cares about is he also cares about our future. I want you to know today that Jesus cares about your future. I had mentioned my mother who died when I was uh, 29 years old or when she was 29. So I was only four. And uh, growing up without a mom, it, it was not ideal. But uh, God gave me a village of people to help raise me. He gave me a wonderful father who never remarried. Dad never remarried. He raised 
uh, my sister and me. And I also had my grandmother and my aunt to raise me. And plus, uh, God gave me an uncle who introduced me to Jesus Christ. So I can say that Jesus cared about my future. He cared about my future. And you see in verse 13, uh, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And we talk about miracles. Jesus showed me compassion when my mother passed away. It was this divine goodbye that my mother gave me. And it was less than 10 words, and it was definitely a miracle because it can't be understood or explained by science or natural law. But on the night that my mother passed away, she said goodbye. And she said, honey, I got to go and I'll see you soon. And I don't have many memories of my mom because I was only four years old when she died. But I will cherish the memory of this divine goodbye forever. She said, honey, I got to go and I'll see you soon. I don't know how she made it to my room. Uh, was this a dream or a vision? I don't know what happened, but I know I was four, and I know I heard those words, and I know I ran and told my dad that I heard those words. And he was perplexed when he heard those words because he's like, how do you know that, you know, what happened? You were asleep, right? He said, Mom told me she had to go, but I'd see her soon. And for me, like, I want to just share with you the compassion of that moment. My mom says, honey, so this is how much she loved me. She called me honey. That was uh, the nickname. And I, I have a tattoo right here. It says mama's honey. Right? And so it, it, it's her, the love that she had for me. And, and I know that she wrote me a note that I later got. And she was calling me honey in this note because she knew she was going to pass away. So she wrote me a note. But she said honey. And so that shows the, the love my mom had for me. And then she said uh, I got to go, but I'll see you soon. So when she said, I'll see you soon, it's almost like the Lord told her that your four-year-old boy is predestined to accept me as Lord and Savior. It's like my mom knew that I was going to heaven before I ever... <laughs> had any clue of even who God was or who Jesus was or what the cross was or what an empty tomb was. But it's like God told her that, oh, you, your boy, he's going to see you soon. He'll be with you. And then the last part, that part about soon, it's going to be soon. Honey, I got to go, but I'll see you soon. And it's like, wow, I, I'm going to see my mom again, and it's not going to be too long. And as my life is progressing, it's like, yeah, mom, it is going to be soon. So this divine goodbye, this miracle, um, this supernatural phenomenon that I experienced at four years old and not really having any memories of my mom, but remembering this compassionate divine goodbye, it shows me that Jesus cares about me. He cares about my grief. He cares about my future. And I just want to ask you today as I share my personal story, have you experienced the compassion from Jesus? And how has God uh, met you with compassion? Is there something in your life that you can hold on to? Like I had that story from over 30 years ago of my mom and how Jesus showed me compassion. Is there uh, something that you can hold on to that you can say, I know um, that Jesus is compassionate. I know that Jesus cares about me. You know, I heard the story from pastor. I hear the story about this widow. Uh, when he saw her, he had compassion. But what about you? I want to encourage you to find that uh, moment to, to hold on to of the compassion of Christ. And the Lord had compassion on this widow, but she probably didn't know that Jesus was even present until Jesus told her, do not weep. 
Look, she didn't notice him, but he noticed her. Yeah, we, we might not even realize uh, the compassion that Jesus is having on us, but he, he notices you. And so Jesus, he, he touched the beer to halt the processional. And then the people stood still who were carrying uh, the young man out on this tragedy. And after Jesus spoke to the widow, do not weep, Jesus spoke to a corpse. This is a dead person. And Jesus said, young man, I say to you, arise. And Luke chapter 7, verse 15 so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite workouts of all time were the sit-ups. Try to get some sit-ups. I was always trying to get some abs. I don't, I don't think I ever really got them. I mean, there might have been like one moment uh, in time, maybe one year, but a sit-up. And I'm like, this, this young man, he did a, a coffin sit-up. <laughs> he sat up in a coffin. He crunched up and started to speak a coffin sit-up. That's what it says in the Bible, right? It says, it says he who was dead sat up. This is the most miraculous crunch that I've ever seen in my entire life. And he began to speak. Jesus performed a public miracle and presented the son to the widowed mother as a gift of compassion. Here you go. He met her need. And when we think about it, we, we do have to say that it is unlikely and truly impossible for a dead person to rise from a casket and start talking. You know, you see it on TV sometimes. Have you seen it on TV before? They use it like for fright or for humor or maybe like the WWE or WWF, like the Undertaker or something like that. Someone sits up out of a coffin, right? But this is not like for real. This is not like... like this is like impossible, right? So what is a definition of a miracle? That, that's kind of important to understand. Waymaker, a study of the miracles of Jesus. What is a definition of a miracle? So I just Googled the definition of a miracle. Got it right here. Put it up on the screen. A surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. See, a miracle, it is a real word and it has a real definition. And this was definitely a surprising and welcome event. Jesus crashed his funeral. Not explicable. Man, why do they use such big words and definitions? Like, I'm just trying to understand miracle. You say explicable. What's that mean? Uh, is not understood, right? Cannot be understood by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. I remember talking to Herbie's doctor in uh, North Carolina and sharing the gospel uh, with him and saying, hey, Dr. Munzer, do you believe in Jesus? This is a renowned doctor, has done a lot of research. He's so kind. He's like one, probably just one of the best doctors we've ever experienced easily. And uh, I was talking to him, and uh, he's going on an elevator down by the cafeteria at the UNC hospital. I said, Dr. Munzer, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, um, you know, Herb, I don't believe in miracles. I believe in science. That's tough. But in this series and in the Bible, um, and even in Google and in the Britannica, I mean, a miracle is a thing. 
it, it, it's a real thing and miracles do happen. Um, and maybe that's holding someone up today. Maybe they're like, you know, I can't really uh, believe in Jesus because I don't believe in miracles. I'm praying that Jesus will show you today that he is the miracle worker. And that that won't be a, a stumbling block for you. you. You have to put your faith in something. <laughs> you have to put your faith in the impossible. I mean, I, I've just always thought there is more to life than, you know, this time on earth that we are given, whether that be short or whether that be long. Like God created us for more. Um, I don't know. For me, I, I just have a mind that I can believe in miracles. And when I look at creation every day, I see a miracle. Uh, when I look at my life, I see a miracle. Um, when I look at my son, I see a miracle. When I look at uh, how my mom gave me that divine goodbye, I see a miracle. Has God done miracles in your life and you're kind of denying that they're not really miracles? Are you looking for like another sign or wonder when he has actually done a miracle? Luke chapter 1, verse 37, from a biblical standpoint, it says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And, you know, this miracle right here, I mean, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, verse 16, fear came upon all and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. So this miracle may have caused some to flash back to the prophet Elijah. Because in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah raised a widow's son from the dead. Remember, he like stretched out over him and like prayed and said, you know, Lord, bring this, uh, bring this widow's son back to life. And then the widow's son came back to life, 1 Kings chapter 17. And then Elijah went to present the widow with her son alive. And so people said, wow, a great prophet has risen up among us. This is what they said about Jesus. So how is uh, Jesus much different than Elijah if in 1 Kings chapter 17 and in Luke chapter 7, they both performed the same miracle? It's very similar. Let me explain. Elijah was in the league of prophets. Now, Elijah was like an all-star prophet. <laughs> he was like the captain of prophets. Like Elijah would be in the starting lineup of prophets. Like Elijah did amazing things on Mount Carmel against those prophets of Baal and Asherah. Like Elijah was absolutely amazing. He raised this widow's son from the dead. So he was in that league of prophets. So now John the Baptist in the New Testament was like the new Elijah. And Jesus said that John the Baptist is even more than a prophet. So uh, John the Baptist is also in the starting lineup of the prophets. Like <laughs> putting out five prophets, I'm like, Elijah's in there, John the Baptist is in there. And Jesus said that uh, John the Baptist is the new Elijah, but they did not recognize him. And they did whatever they wanted to him and caused him to suffer. Now, John the Baptist said of Jesus, I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. So John the Baptist said, me and Jesus, we're not on the same levels. But Elijah and John are on similar levels. They're in this uh, league of prophets. But Jesus is in his own league called the Godhead. This is a very exclusive league. This is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and no one else is getting in there, right? They've tried to put other people in that league, but no one else is in that league. And so John the Baptist, this is a little past our main passage, but this is just a little bonus. As we see in verse 19, John said, uh, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus saying, Jesus, 
are you the coming one or do we look for another? Because they, they were looking for Elijah. And then I came, but they didn't recognize the new Elijah. So are, are you the one that we are to look for or is it someone else? And in Luke chapter 7, verse 22, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And so the miracle at Nain not only shows that Jesus cares about our grief and that he cares about our future, but it also signaled the arrival of the Messiah. And before the city ever had its name, Nain, which means beauty, God ordained that Jesus would do a miracle of beauty on that parcel of land. Jesus cares about your grief. He cares about your future. And miracles can only be explained by God. I hope you believe in him today. Hope you put your trust in him. I know we can't understand these things. You know, we can't understand how this actually happened. But it did. And it's recorded. And I'm thankful for Luke for recording this miracle for us. So may you be encouraged by the word of God. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for being a miracle worker. Lord, thank you so much for helping us in our grief. Lord, thank you so much for being compassionate towards us. Lord, you know what we need and you'll meet that need. Oh, Father, I, I just continue to pray your blessing and miracles over your people. Lord, this is your church. This is your sheep, your congregation. These are the ones that you love. And Father, we are praying for a miracle today, a miracle of salvation for those who don't know you. So if there is someone in here who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but you want to put your faith in him today, finally? Let's do it today. And I know it's hard for you to understand. You're like, how is this actually happening? But maybe you've come to that point where you're going to say, today, I'm just going to trust God. Today, I'm going to believe that he's a way maker. Let him crash on your life. You may be spiritually dead without a pulse, but Jesus comes to give you life and life more abundantly. Will you put your faith in Jesus today? If that's you, today is the day for salvation. You can say, dear God, raise your hand to heaven if that's you. Say, dear God, I put my faith in you today. I believe that you do miracles and work this miracle of salvation in my life. I love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.